Thanks, Kevin. Uh, can everyone hear me all right? Okay. Um, so first of all, I'm going to present a case that I saw a two-year-old with leukocoria. So first of all, about where I'm from, last year in Fargo, we had the privilege of hosting ESPN College Game Day. That was a nice September fall day. There's North Dakota in its glory. So if, if you're thinking of visiting, come earlier than, rather than later. You got a great name for coming to New Mexico. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, so without further ado, let's get to why I'm talking. Um, so first of all, uh, the patient we saw was a two-year-old male. Um, for giving him a name, we'll go with AJ. That was not his initials. Um, first of all, his chief complaint why we saw him, uh, he had an abnormal pupillary reflex. His father noted that for about two weeks prior to coming, in, to coming into seeing the pediatrician, he noticed kind of a whitish glint in the pupillary reflex while camping. Um, so of note, uh, past medical history for this two-year-old boy, uh, he had a normal birth history. He was a full-term, non-full-term boy with no complications at birth. He was a normal weight. Uh, family history was negative for vision loss at a young age, vision loss for glaucoma or any other causes, and um, he did not have a past ocular history, or any, nor was he on any medications or have any pertinent or any allergies of note. So, um, so Dr. Hoffman saw our patient AJ at the request of uh, the pediatrician. Um, so on exam, the visual acuity on covering of the right eye, the child was quite temperamental and did not like the occlusion. Um, on exam of the pupils, no APD was noted. The extraocular motility was full bilaterally. The, the red reflex was diminished on the left compared to the right. Uh, alignment was orthophoric. Uh, the anterior segment exam was within normal limits. And the dilated fundus exam, on the right eye there was a normal posterior pole. And the left, there were just noted to be vitreous opacities and a large raised white lesion in the periphery superiorly and possibly nasally. So at this point, um, what would, first of all, what would, may, what would you think may be going on in this patient? And, and from a broader perspective, what are some of the things you should be thinking about in a patient who presents with leukocoria medicine? Residents, attendings, jump on in. out there, so don't be shy. Okay. Okay, good. Um, thinking more broadly beyond what may seem <coughs> likely to be presenting in this case, um, any other causes you might want to, that may be confused with retinoblastoma, So on the next slide, I have a list. Uh, we talked about retinoblastoma, Coats disease, cataract, other things could be ROP. Uh, that would seem to be less likely in our patient. As you have normal birth weight full term, child uh, fever, ocular toxicoriasis, um, PHPV, and uh, even a coloboma. So there, that's by no means an, ex an, exhaust an exhaustive list, but um, as we get going, it'll be quite obvious what's going on. So um, Dr. Rama Subramanian performed an exam under anesthesia after being having the patient referred to her from Dr. Hoffman. Uh, IOP was 14 in the right eye, 12 in the left. Retinoscopy, uh, plus one right eye. Uh, Plano in the left, the anterior segment, again, was within normal limits bilaterally. Uh, of note, there was no, no cataract. I, 
iris atrophy or neovascularization of the iris. Uh, fundus exam, right, I was within normal limits. And per Dr. Subramanian, uh, there was a large nasal retinoblastoma measuring 14 by 14 by 9 millimeters with surrounding subretinal fluid and expansive vitreous seeds. And a left eye ultrasound was performed as well, uh, showing a large nasal retina tumor with multiple vitreous seeds with a maximal thickness of 8.5 millimeters. So, um, so here's the RETCAM imaging. Does anyone want to kind of jump in and take a stab at what you see? Um, and as you're saying, you can kind of see some of the spots here. It's easier from my vantage point, but in the lower left, you can see probably between the 12 and 1 o'clock position, about um, a little more than halfway up the fundus, you can see kind of white spots. And that was um, what Dr. Subramanian was calling the vitreous seeding. So if you haven't seen that. Okay, so um, Dr. Subramanian, this assessment and plan. Uh, first of all, she said it was um, consistent with the unilateral retinoblastoma of the group E classification with the ICRB. Um, the there are five A, B, C, D, and E, with E being the most severe and having the worst prognosis. Uh, so, so for a plan, treatment options were discussed with the parents of the child, and enucleation was decided upon. Um, it was also discussed that uh, there will be a future need for systemic chemotherapy if high-risk features were present path histopathologically, and I'll get to that in just a second here. And follow-up to be to include MRI twice yearly until five years of age to uh, rule out intracranial tumor. And genetic testing and family screening were also going to be performed. Of note, uh, there was a nine-month-old sibling who was going to be tested and to follow up with oncology regularly. So um, here's a couple, two slides of the tumor that I saw with Dr. Mammos on pathology readouts. That was where, where I actually became involved with the case. Um, so on the left, you can see the tumor, um, part of it. You can see the vitreous seeding and initially started out as an um, exophytic mass and then becoming an endophytic mass. And you can see how it's bulging prominently anteriorly and that would be consistent with what we saw in the wet cam imaging. Um, and you can also see down here these kind of, um, sorry, excuse me. Uh, you can see these purple, within the optic nerve, you can see these, this, these basophilic cells, which are um, invading, the, so the tumor has invaded the optic nerve. But on, on closer, on a higher magnification, you can see that the tumor again has invaded the nerve but it is pre-laminar, it has not invaded the laminar fibrosa, so that'd be a better prognostic factor. So, so as part of the histology and ruling out um, if a tumor is high risk and would need systemic chemotherapy, you would look at the anterior chamber, and from the image on the left, you can see um, a small spot that's basophilic, and on the right, you can see that image magnified with a, um, a few cells there, so you, um, but per Dr. Mamlis, um, the tumor was a moderately well differentiated retinoblastoma with Flexner, Wintner, Steiner, Steiner rosettes. Uh, it was, seemed to be exophytic initially and had become endophytic. Um, so, of note, for the high, high risk uh, state to see if there was a need for systemic chemotherapy, no choroidal invasion was noted. The trabecular meshwork was free of tumor. There was prelaminar invasion of the optic nerve. However, the distal nerve beyond the laminar fibrosa was free of tumor, um, and, it was, and it was thought that the anterior chamber cells were probably a spillover and not necessarily a true infiltration. They were only seen on one slice of one slide. And so the decision was made 
not to give adjuvant chemotherapy. So, so in going through uh, the case, I was curious about some of the treatment options, what had been discussed um, with Dr. Hoffman and Dr. Subramanian and the parents. Enucleation was the decided um, treatment. Also, other treatments include systemic chemotherapy, also known as chemoreduction, with typically with the vincristin, etoposide, and carboplatin agents. Uh, this is typically has much more, many more systemic side effects, and so um, other modalities are being investigated on. But uh, chemoreduction still is it's probably the most well studied and most used modality. Um, external beam radiation was more used in the past. Um, this one uh, is associated with um, radi radiation exposure and secondary to that uh, potential tumors as well with even within the orbit. Um, for a retinoblastoma that wouldn't be as advanced, typically like an ICRB class grade A, uh, you'd think about more focal local therapies, cryotherapy, laser therapy, thermal therapy, plaque radiotherapy. And of the last two of note, I'll talk a little bit more about um, the intra-arterial chemotherapy. It's a newer modality, it involves the injection of uh, chemotherapeutic agents directly into the optic nerve via cannulation of the femoral artery up into the ophthalmic artery. Um, and that's typically using melphalan. It was developed in the past by um, in the 1950s, and more recently, Dr. Abramson in New York has been studying the studying this as well as the, a group at Little's Eye. Um, and intravitreal chemotherapy uh, can be used um, as well. So, um, oh, so here's just an image, kind of a radiologic image showing the cannulation of the ophthalmic artery. On the left, um, you can see the catheter tip just approaching the ophthalmic artery. And on the right, you can see the tip and then the perfusion of the orbit and the eye. So um, previous, previously, t before um, the study of the intravitreal melphalan by the Shields group in Philadelphia, they uh, did a study using the intraarterial chemotherapy on 16 eyes. Um, there was a subset of patients who had both solid tumor and either subretinal seeds or vitreous seeds. And so I wanted to look into that, given being that our patient had these vitreous seeds. And so despite IAC treatment, there were two patients of the nine that had the vitreous seeds that either had partial response or recurrence. And so this is kind of a follow-up study to that saying, well, is intravitreal methylen, um, can it be used as a further treatment? So uh, in this study, 11 eyes of 11 patients with either viable persistent or recurrent vitreous seeds after initial treatment with either IV chemotherapy or chemoreduction or the IAC were were given intravitreal melphalan at the dosage of 20 to 30 micrograms with concurrent triple freeze cryotherapy to limit the um, to limit the pre to limit the prevention of METs or even um, choroidal expansion of the tumor with the therapy, um, and they found complete seed resolution after a mean of two injections, the range between one to six injections, and by a mean of nine months with a range of six to 16 months. Uh, follow-up complete vitreous seed regression with no recurrence was seen in all 11 cases, and the gold salvage was noted to be 100%. So uh, the six patients that were followed for nine months or longer from first injection, no recurrence was observed. Um, in the study, they noted that there were no major complications of vitreous hemorrhage, infection, retinal hemorrhage, or retinal detachment. And uh, however, they did note some minor complications uh, including focal RPE modeling near the injection site in two eyes and non-axial posterior lens opacity. Um, other studies have re reported more, um, more serious side effects, but based on this study, it was a small sample size. That was what was reported. So that concludes my case presentation on a three-year-old patient with retinoblastoma treated with a nucleation. Questions, thoughts, discussion? So, this information was the one you were asking in the class two years. What's the five years of that? Sorry, you're looking at So, it goes like this. <coughs> what, what, what's the five years of that? Is? So, if you're the five years of that, you're the first time. Yeah, you did the uh, NUDS the first time. What, and what, what does that mean? So, you're just looking at the 90. Well, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm 
Thank you.